Ptolemy's theorem is a classical result in geometry that says that if we take any cyclic quadrilateral, ABCD, meaning a quadrilateral that can be inscribed in a circle, then the product of the diagonals is the sum of the products we get from multiplying opposite sides. So in this diagram, the two pairs of opposite sides have the same colors, blue and red, and the diagonals are green. And sure enough, as we vary points on the circle, it at least seems as if the red product plus the blue product equals the green product. Now there are many proofs of this, some of which use just geometry, some of which use complex numbers, but this one is one that I at least haven't found anywhere else before. So step one is we're going to put the quadrilateral in the complex plane. Step two is to convert the statement of the theorem into an algebraic identity involving complex numbers. And then all we have to do is prove that identity. Now, that's easier said than done though, because the identity we have to prove is a horrible, horrible mess. It takes up quite a bit of space if we actually write it all out and expanding it would be a bit of a nightmare. So fortunately, there are some shortcuts for proving this. We don't actually have to expand it all out and check it, but we'll get to that part a bit later. So first we put the whole diagram in the complex plane and we'll represent each point with a complex number. Capital A corresponds to the complex number, lowercase a, and so on. And since we can rescale a picture without changing anything, we might as well assume that this is the unit circle. So it's centered at the origin and these four complex numbers have absolute value one. Now there are a few facts about complex numbers that we'll need here. One of the basic facts we'll need is that if we take any two complex numbers, z and w, then the distance between them is just the absolute value of the difference. One way to prove this is just to write z and w in rectangular form, expand it all out, and then it really just becomes the Pythagorean theorem. But doing that is going to be a bit messy for our purposes, so we're going to use a different way of dealing with these absolute values. So one other key property is that if we take a complex number and multiply it by its conjugate, we always get the square of the absolute value. And in particular, if we start with a complex number whose absolute value is 1, meaning it's on the unit circle, its conjugate is equal to its reciprocal because we get z, z bar equals one. Now these are really the only facts about complex numbers that we'll need for the proof. Now the next step is just to write these six distances in terms of the complex numbers. So we get six terms, each of which is the absolute value of a difference, and it's already pretty messy, unfortunately but we're going to make it even messier by squaring both sides. So the advantage of this is that whenever we have the square of an absolute value, we can write it in terms of a complex number and its conjugate. So for each term that's an absolute value squared, we write it as the difference times the conjugate of the difference, and then we expand that out. So for example, with absolute value a minus c squared, it's a minus c times a bar minus c bar, and then we expand that all out. And then we use the fact that conjugation is the same as taking the reciprocal on the unit circle. So a a bar turns into 1, a c bar turns into a over c, a bar c turns into c over a, and c c bar turns into 1. And we can get similar expressions for the other terms as well. Now, that takes care of almost everything except we still have this product on the right side that doesn't have any squares in it. So we need to move everything else over to the left and then square one more time. And 
that's how we get this pretty nasty looking identity. But at least in theory, this is something we could expand out. Now we don't actually need to do that because we're going to use a few algebra tricks to cut down on most of the calculations. So remember that whenever we have the square of an absolute value, we have a constant and then each variable divided by the other. So on the left side of this equation, if we focus on a, for example, it will be some number times a plus a constant plus some number times one over a. And those coefficients can depend on b, c, and d, of course. But here we're just thinking of it as a rational function of a and fixing b, c, and d. So when we square that whole thing, we end up with a squared, a, a constant, one over a, and one over a squared as the powers. And the same thing happens on the right side as well. So after we clear denominators by multiplying through by a squared, we end up with a quartic in a. Now checking this identity directly would take quite a bit of work. So what we'll do to get around that is just use the fact that if we have two polynomials of degree four and they agree at five places, they're automatically equal. So all we have to do is check that the identity is true for five values of a. And that's equivalent to checking that the statement of Ptolemy's theorem is true for five locations of the point a. So there are a few points where it's really easy to check that the identity is true. So one of them is from letting a equal b, or to phrase it more rigorously, we're taking the limit as a approaches b. Then the product of a, b, and c, d goes to zero, and we're left with just comparing the blue and the green products, and those will be equal in the limit. Then we can do the same thing where a approaches d, and we'll end up with a degenerate case, and the identity holds. Now, we can keep going, though, moving a around the circle until it reaches c. Now this case is a little trickier because the diagonals are no longer the green lengths, they're actually the red lengths, because the original quadrilateral has crossed over itself. So interpreted literally, the equation in Ptolemy's theorem is false in this situation. However, all the squaring in the process of getting that algebraic identity gave us something symmetric in A, B, C, and D. So it's actually okay to let a approach C, and again we get another case where it's easy to check that it really does work. But now the red product equals the sum of the other two products. So that gives us three values of A where the identity is true, basically for free. And then we need two more. So what we'll do is pick values of A that give us trapezoids. So it really boils down to checking the identity for triangles and trapezoids. Now in the case of a trapezoid, for one thing, it's an isosceles trapezoid. The two legs are equal because it's inscribed in a circle. And so A, B, and C, D have equal lengths. Then if we drop an altitude, we can label the bases as X and Y and the height as H. And now we just write everything in terms of those variables using the Pythagorean theorem. So to get the red lengths, we have triangles with base y minus x over 2 and height h. So we get root y minus x over 2 squared plus h squared for the red lengths. And for the green ones, we have right triangles with base y plus x over 2 and height h. So we get a similar expression for the diagonals. And now we just plug everything in and check that it actually works. So when we take the product of the diagonals, the square roots go away. And similarly, the product of the legs makes the square root go away there as well. And 
the identity we're left with is really easy to check. The h squareds disappear, and we're left with essentially a difference of squares if we rearrange it a bit. So this establishes Ptolemy's theorem because we've checked it for five values of a. Now Ptolemy's theorem often comes in handy when dealing with cyclic polygons, but it's especially nice in the case of a regular pentagon. So let's take a regular pentagon with side length one. And one thing to notice right away is that all the diagonals are congruent. And now if we focus on just four of the five vertices, they form a cyclic quadrilateral. So we can apply Ptolemy's theorem. Now we assume the side length of the pentagon is one, and the other three sides are all diagonals of the original pentagon. So we can give those a name, say x. Then when we apply Ptolemy's theorem, the product of the diagonals is x squared. The product of the blue lengths is x, and the product of the red lengths is 1. So we end up with just x squared equals x plus 1, and that means x equals the golden ratio. And a similar trick will give an interesting identity for a heptagon, a regular 7-gon. Although writing down the lengths exactly isn't really doable in a nice way, we can still get an interesting algebraic identity out of it.